So good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you're joining us in the world. Uh, welcome back, or welcome to Immersed, brought to you by the Immersion Lab, the MIT Nano Immersion Lab. The Immersion Lab is a central and shared facility at MIT, providing facilities and capabilities in AR and VR, immersive technologies from motion capture to visualizing and interacting with the data that's coming from our world and the data that goes into our world. Today is immersed in embodied AI. And it's my pleasure to introduce Jeremy Schwartz, who is the project lead for 3D World um, in the department of, been developed in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Science. Uh, Jeremy comes to us with a, a, a wealth of experience. Uh, he, for years, has worked in the, the video gaming industry, uh, worked at Electronic Arts and Acclaim Entertainment, um, served as a design consultant, um, a technology analyst, and has been extensively developing digital and hybrid experiences. And today, Jeremy will be sharing with us 3D World. So a little bit of a sort of a presentation today. And then after that, uh, Talis Rex and Praneeth Namburi uh, will be sharing a little bit of a demo. Uh, so please uh, ask your questions as, as we go. We'll try to answer them in chat as we, as we have in the past. Um, but with that, um, Jeremy, I thank you very much for joining us today. And I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Well, hi, everyone. As Brian said, I'm Jeremy Schwartz, and I'm the project lead for the development of 3D World, or TDW, as we call it for short. TDW is a multimodal platform for interactive physical simulation. With TDW, users can simulate high fidelity sensory data and physical interactions between mobile agents and objects in a wide variety of rich 3D environments. So TDW was released as a public platform in July of 2020 and is being actively used by many institutions and research labs around the world. TDW websites, 3dworld.org, and you can reach the TDW GitHub repo from there. So in this session, I'm gonna start with a general overview of TDW's features and capabilities, and then drill down on how it's being used for embodied AI and physical scene interaction. I'll also share some of our work in progress on developing realistic humanoid agents suitable for experiments in human-robot collaboration. Okay, let's get started. So first, a little background on why we developed TDW. Machine perceptual systems typically require large amounts of labeled data, data that's laborious to come by, but can also be quite expensive. In addition, there are some quantities, such as the mass of an object or the material it's made of, that could be difficult for human observers to label accurately. So around four years ago, we started developing TDW as a way to address the situation. The idea was that by generating scenes in a virtual world, we could have complete control over data generation with full access to all associated generative parameters. This would allow us to train machine perceptual systems as virtual agents inhabiting the world. TDW is built on top of the state-of-the-art game development platform, Unity. Unity is cross-platform, so this allows us to run TDW on Windows, OS X, and Linux. It handles the image rendering, audio rendering, and physics for us. So what you're seeing on the screen are just some examples of TDW's simulation engine output, including its advanced physics. I'm going to certainly go into more detail about all of this shortly. So there are four key aspects of TDW I'd like to talk about. First, we'll look at some example use cases that illustrate the generality and flexibility of TDW's design. Next, I'll cover the ways in which we afford equal status to visual and auditory modalities and how that allows us to create synthetic imagery at near photoreal levels and generate sounds with a high level of acoustic fidelity. Then I'll discuss TDW's advanced physics capabilities that allow rigid body objects, soft body objects, cloth and fluids to all interact together. Coupled with that, we will explore the multiple paradigms we use to interact with objects and generate physically realistic behavior. Direct or object-to-object -object interactions are where users directly affect objects through API commands. Indirect or agent-to-object -object interactions are interactions that utilize some form of embodied agent. And as you'll see, TDW supports several types of agents. Users can even interact directly in VR, picking up virtual objects using virtual representations of their hands. 
So first, let's talk about the design of TBW. So a key goal in designing the platform was to create a very general and very flexible platform capable of supporting a wide range of use cases. What this means in practice is that compared to some other simulation platforms and frameworks, TDW does not impose any particular metaphor on the user in terms of the types of simulations it can generate. For example, some simulation frameworks only support interior floor plan environments, i.e. rooms with furniture, or specific paradigms like navigation. TDW can do those too, but we can also generate experimental stimuli of a more custom or specific nature. We can, for example, support use cases dealing with fine-grained image classification and object detection physical prediction and inference, infant play behavior, or task and motion planning. So let's take a quick look at some examples of some different use cases. Here we see an example of generating data sets of synthetic images, usually used for training networks to generalize against real world images, such as those from ImageNet. These images were generated for the purpose of collecting neural responses from primates while viewing synthetically generated images. Here, 3D objects for all exemplars of a given semantic category, chair in this case, are loaded into a virtual scene. To increase variability, each image has randomized camera and positional parameters and may have additional random parameters such as the angle of the sun or the visual materials of the model. This randomness is constrained somewhat in order to guarantee that the object is always at least partially in the frame. Here we see an example of TDW being used for the training and evaluation of physically realistic forward prediction algorithms. As human beings, we learn at a very early age that the results of objects coming into contact with each other affects how we interact with them. For agents to learn this, they must understand how momentum and geometry affect collisions. So in this clip, randomly generated or randomly selected rather toys are created with, physical, with random physics material values. A force of randomized magnitude is applied to one toy which is then aimed at another. Another key use case area for TDW as shown in this third example is embodied AI, where embodied agents are trained to interact with the environment and potentially change scene state in some way. Here you see an agent performing part of a TAMP or task and motion planning task involving the location and retrieval of target objects. We'll dig deeper into this area as well when we discuss physical interaction in TDW. However, before we dive into TDW's features in detail, I think it'd be helpful to look at the platform's high-level system and architecture and introduce some terms that you'll hear throughout this session. And while looking at the architecture, we can also take a deep look at our API. So a TDW simulation is composed of two main components. The build in blue on the left is a Unity executable of TDW simulation engine. It could be either Linux, OS X, or Windows. The build is responsible for image rendering, audio synthesis, and all physical simulation. The controller in green is a Python program which communicates with the build over TCP IP and uses TDW's comprehensive command and control API. The controller sends commands to the build which executes those commands. The build can then return a wide range of data types to the controller representing the state of the virtual world. Data types include image data, such as image renders, segmentation ID images, semantic classification images, and other types. Collision data, including whether objects are discreetly impacting, rolling, or scraping. And spatial and transform data, such as position, orientation, object bounds, etc. Users, i.e. researchers, write controllers to suit the needs of their use case. Basic Python skills are really the only requirement for using TDW successfully. In addition to the build and controller, the platform architecture includes two other key components. The first is an Amazon S3 repository where 3D object models, scene models, material files, and HDRI skyboxes are stored. I'll explain more about all of these in a minute. Object and environment models are downloaded at runtime into the build as asset bundles, which are compressed binary versions of the model data. Once downloaded, all model data is cached. This means that rebuilding the scene, for example, when, when running successive trials is essentially instantaneous. The second key component is a JSON records database, which is stored locally. This database contains all model and other metadata used by TBW. A set of librarians, which are basically Python wrapper classes, handle the querying of these metadata records at runtime by the controller. 
Our API contains over 200 commands covering tasks like scene setup and manipulation, object loading and modification, camera and rendering controls, object interaction using physics, and agent navigation and control. These are general purpose atomic commands. You can think of them as Lego-like building blocks for creating higher level behaviors. Unlike many sim available simulation frameworks, TDW controllers can send multiple commands per time step, allowing for arbitrarily complex simulation behavior. The build can run standalone, locally on a laptop, for example, or on a remote server. It can also run within a Docker container. The TGW documentation is one of the platform's strongest features. Every command and every variable in the API is fully documented, complete with numerous example controller scripts. I think we have 45 at the present count. In addition, we have numerous documents addressing specific topics such as best practices for improving photorealism, how to handle observation data, how to set up scenes, how to do audio and video recording, and many more. Okay, so let's jump into talking about TDW's features and capabilities. And we'll start by talking about how it handles multiple modalities. Visually, we strive for the highest level of photorealism possible. We achieve this through the lighting and rendering approaches we use and the high quality 3D environment and object models from our library. We use 100% real-time global illumination with no light map baking. Our lighting model uses a single light source representing the sun used for dynamic lighting, the type of lighting that causes objects to cast shadows in a scene. For general environment lighting, we utilize high dynamic range image or HDRI skyboxes. If you're not familiar with those or the skybox, think about how a planetarium projection works. HDRI images contain substantially more information than a standard digital image. They capture the lighting conditions at real locations for a given time of day. And they're typically used in movies to integrate computer generated imagery with live action photography. In this clip, TDW is automatically adjusting the elevation of the sun to match the time of day in the HDRI image. This affects the shadow length. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, the intensity of the sun is being adjusted to match the shadow strength in the image. The HDRI image is being rotated to simulate different viewing positions. The sun angle is therefore correspondingly adjusted so the direction of the dynamic shadows continues to match the direction of the environment shadows from the HDRI map. Most scenes in TDW start off with some kind of environment. Our environment assets span both indoor and outdoor scenes, including several environments created from high quality scanned photogrammetry assets. Many environments are designed for maximum variability with large amounts of detail, both object and surface detail. So any arbitrary viewpoint within the scene will deliver a suitably complex and varied background. The outdoor images on this slide contain assets such as rocks and pebbles, mossy boulders, areas of mud and grass, sections of cliff faces and other real world terrain elements scanned from various locations around the world, such as the lava beaches in Iceland that you see in the top right image. Environments are then populated with objects from our library of over 2,500 high quality 3D models that spans around 200 semantic categories. Most of our 3D model assets were originally created for high end rendering applications, but have been optimized for real time 3D rendering. They use PBR or physically based rendering materials that respond to light in a physically correct manner. Models are also normalized to real world scale given a canonical orientation and semantically annotated with the appropriate semantic categories. For example, chair, copy maker, toy, dog. Models can be placed around a scene in various ways. They can be placed completely procedurally, i.e. based on some algorithm such as stacking or random scattering within room bounds. And you can see a couple of examples of this here. Alternatively, object placement can be based on an explicitly scripted arrangement, for example, a dining table set for dinner or the scene in the top right image. So the auditory modality is equally important in TDW, and the platform provides a high degree of acoustic rendering fidelity. For sounds placed within interior environments, TDW uses a combination of Unity's built-in audio and Resonance Audio's 3D spatialization to provide real-time audio propagation, high-quality simulated reverberation, and directional cues via head-related transfer functions. Sounds are attenuated by distance and can be occluded by objects and environment geometry. Reverberation automatically varies with the geometry of the space, the virtual materials applied to walls, floor, and ceiling, 
and the percentage of room volume occupied by solid objects such as furniture. However, it's TDW's advanced physics-based synthesis of impact sounds that's a really standout feature. TDW's Pi Impact Python library uses modal synthesis to generate plausible realistic impact sounds in real time based on the masses and materials of colliding objects, as well as parameters of the collision, such as object velocity and angles of impact as returned by the build. Pi Impact currently supports 14 material types, including metal, glass, ceramic, soft and hard plastics, cardboard, stone, and others. Let's look at and listen to some examples. Coming through. Okay, let's talk about physical scene interaction. Uh, the first type of scene interaction is object to object. Um, basically, you've gone to great lengths to enable believable and realistic object interactions through accurate physics behavior. TDW actually includes two separate physics engines which serve, which serve different purposes. So Unity's basic engine, PhysX, handles rigid body physics, including the collisions between rigid bodies. For example, by applying a forward directional force to an object, we need to collide with other objects as we see on the left. Or we can apply an upward force at a specific point, for example, to tip a dining table and make the object slide off as we see on the right. To achieve what we refer to as fast but accurate rigid body collisions between our library models, we use the VHACD approximate convex decomposition algorithm to generate groups of convex mesh hull colliders. In this image, these colliders are shown in green. Basically, that these form fitting colliders are economically organized and provide an optimal balance between performance and accuracy. And we can further refine that interaction behavior by um, modifying mass, friction, or restitution or bounciness at runtime on a per object basis. The second physics engine we use in TDW, NVIDIA Flex, uses a particle based representation of the underlying model to manage collisions between different object types. On the left, we use the cloth simulation to drop a rubbery sheet, which collides with a rigid body fire hydrant object. And on the right, a fridge model is dropped into a pool of water, causing significant, significant displacement and splashing. Dropping objects of different sizes, masses, and all materials into fluids and observing the splash behavior can be useful in estimating these quantities. So let's for now dive into what we mean by agent in TDW. TDW supports a wide range of agent types. The most basic level, are agents can be as simple as a disembodied camera capable of returning image data from the build to, con to the controller. We could have more than one camera in the scene, so we could have first person, third person cameras, etc. Basic agents uh, are ones whose embodiments are geometric primitives such as cubes, spheres, or capsules, and we can move them around the environment by applying forces. These agents are often used for algorithmic prototyping. Then the next level up are complex robotic agents with advanced embodiments such as articulated limbs that are capable of both mobility and sophisticated physical interactions with the environments and objects within it. And as we mentioned at the beginning, uh, we're working on some near photoreal humanoid agents driven by motion capture data that move and behave in a realistic fashion. These agents can perform typical human actions such as vacuuming the floor, setting the table, or carrying a tray of food. So let's take a look at some examples of this, these agent to object interactions, um, both robot and humanoid, humanoid uh, and see how they physically interact with the environment. In embodied AI research, it's especially important that embodied agents have physically mapped action spaces that allow them to interact with the environment, effectively changing both object and scene state. To that end, in TDW, we have Magnabot, a robotic agent with articulated arms that terminate in nine degree of freedom magnet end effectors. Magnabot is fully physics driven. There's no animation involved. Directional movement and turning are achieved by controlling revolute joint drive. Arm articulation utilizes one degree of freedom or three degree of freedom joints in com combination with an IK or inverse kinematic system to facilitate sophisticated reaching actions. 
As you can see, Magnabot can also move its torso vertically along its central column, implemented as a prismatic joint, allowing it to reach objects at a considerable height above the ground. Agents like Magnabot can be equipped with cameras capable of generating RGB images, as well as various camera passes, such as depth maps, normal maps, object segmentation, and semantic classification. Besides the agent's egocentric view, additional cameras can be linked to the agent to provide a third person follow camera or a static tracking camera view. So this is a good opportunity to show you an example of how we use this type of agent in TDW. So in conjunction with the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab, we recently launched the TDW Transport Challenge, a visually guided task and motion planning benchmark for physically realistic embodied AI. In this challenge, our Magnabot agent is spawned randomly in a simulated physical home environment. The agent must collect a small set of objects scattered around the house and transport them to a specific location. Objects might be things like uh, transport one toy, two bowls, and one jug to the bed. The agent has an interaction budget, in other words, a fixed number of actions that it must stay within in order to successfully complete the challenge. We also position containers around the house that can be used as tools to transport objects efficiently. On its own, the agent can carry at most two objects at a time. However, using a container could carry several objects at once. However, locating and retrieving a container could use up valuable interaction steps. Therefore, the agent must plan the optimal path to transport the objects to the goal location and reason about whether to use containers or not. For the challenge, we developed a high-level action space for the agent that includes commands such as put in and pour out. Here you see Magnabot performing the put in action. Um, it's actually been slowed down a little bit so you can see the nuances of the arm articulation taking place. Besides Magnabot, TDW also supports the import of standard URDF robot descriptor files. As a first step towards supporting sim to real transfer to real world robots, this capability allows users to import their own robot models, to control them inside a TDW simulation. Some of the existing robot models in the TDW distribution include Sawyer, Fetch, Baxter, UR5, and UR10. In this example, the, UR, the, mo <coughs> excuse me, the movement of the UR5 robot arm is being controlled through a series of low level API commands that drive the revolute joints of the arm. By using these low-level commands, users could potentially build higher-level interaction behaviors like those provided by the Magnabot API. We're actually working on several initiatives related to human-robot collaboration that leverage this capability and the realistic humanoid agents, which I will show you next. So, so far, we looked at the robot side of human-robot collaboration. Let's take a look now at the human side. As I mentioned earlier, a big part of our current development is the humanoid agent. We're calling this agent replicant, and it will be able to physically interact with the environment at a detailed level. The agent will utilize a range of photorealistic 3D model skins, allowing agents to be easily male, female, or even a child. This visual realism will be augmented with equally realistic body motion derived from motion capture data. We have, a complete, we have a couple of strategies for building a library of motion capture data, which I'll go into in more detail in a minute. <coughs> the agent will also have fully articulated hands capable of high dexterity physical interaction. For example, this will enable performing fine motor control tasks, such as doing a jigsaw or similar puzzle that could potentially transfer to a robot hand, such as the shadow dexterous hand. The agent structure will include a camera for egocentric views that will rotate along with the agent's head. And they'll have the same kind of camera passes as any other TDW agent. A lot like a high-end video game, a runtime motion blending and transition handling system will allow us to seamlessly blend between different motion capture animations. However, in addition to this blending, we plan to include the ability to procedurally modify the agent's motion at runtime. This will allow reactive animations, if you will, as event feedback. For example, the agent's head turning in the direction of a heard sound or some other new point of interest in the scene. This runtime constraint-based system will also allow us to modify pre-existing animations in responses to changes in object state. For example, the agent's pickup animation could change dynamically to reflect a new or moving target position. 
preliminary version of Replicant will be part of the next release of TDW at the end of this month. So <clears throat> we plan to build our motion library using a combination of strategies. Um, the first one is to work with the immersion lab to capture motions requiring larger space to work within, tracking of prop objects. We also want to explore mixing mocap with other technologies such as VR. Actually, Talos will be showing some examples from a recent capture session we did with the lab in his segment of the program. Um, we also uh, are in the process of purchasing a Rococo wireless mocap suit that will allow us to capture very basic motions at home or in the office with a high degree of spontaneity. So this would allow us, for example, to be sitting in a meeting with one person in a suit discussing what kind of moves we need and the person could get up, perform that move and uh, potentially process that data and have it in TDW in a, in a comparatively short period of time. So <clears throat> here's an example of some data captured from the suit. This is basically um, a demo I was given and I instructed the, or requested the uh, actor to uh, perform some basic reaching, pick up and placement actions. And uh, this is the data that was generated from the suit. And this is applied to one of our replicant characters. So this is the kind of behavior and motion that we're, that we're looking for. Here we're testing a pure IK-based reaching action in combination with the motion capture move. This is very preliminary. There's no transition from walk to idle stance, for example. However, the agent is quick, equipped with colliders and can interact with scene objects such as the chair it collided with. In the reach sequence, the ball target object is being randomly positioned and its location left or right of the agent's centroid determines which arm is used to reach with. So we plan to improve on this by layering IK on top of reach actions we captured in the immersion lab to improve the realism and fluidity of the resultant motion while still allowing dynamic adjustments at the reach target position. So here, we've added a preliminary grasp behavior to the reach action. In the first example, the agent drops the object in its current orientation. Of course, it was in the second example, the object's rotation is slightly adjusted as part of the drop action to maintain its canonical orientation. In this early grasp action, there's no attempt to pose the hand in any way or control where on the object the hand is actually connecting to. It simply attaches the object's pivot at the base of the vase to the agent's arm and effector location, which is in the middle of the agent's palm. Now, <clears throat> we're working right now on extending this a little bit by combining our reach action with a system for assigning affordance points to objects. For example, the basket in this image or in this sequence has four affordance points defined. The system can either use an explicitly labeled affordance or else select the closest one to the agent's end effector, depending on his ori its orientation with respect to the basket. Affordance points locations are defined as JSON object metadata and therefore can be easily adjusted at any time. Let me just play that a couple more times. So you can see here that the actual um, pivot point object of the basket is in the center at the base but it's actually reaching for that uh, affordance point on the side, which was the closest one to where the agent's arm was. So <clears throat> next steps for our replicant agent would be to um, over the next three months, make significant additions to our motion capture library, uh, capturing a range of everyday actions relevant to the, our human coll robot collaboration projects and other use cases. Additionally, we're gonna be working on a physics-based grasping mechanic that will enable us to grasp and carry arbitrary objects in a realistic and stable fashion. So in other words, we'll basically be able to close the fingers of the agent's hand around the affordance of an object like the handle on a cup or around the surface of a vase and effectively stop that um, you know, joint rotation at the point at which it's uh, contacting the surface of the object. We also plan to implement the, the full motion blending and transition system I mentioned before as a first step towards runtime motion modification system planned for phase two of our replicant development. 
So the third and last interaction paradigm I want to talk about is human to object, meaning a human user interacting directly with the scene in virtual reality. We have quite a number of uh, projects using VR in TDW, and uh, we're, we're definitely keen to expand the range of capabilities we can do in VR. As you can see, um, this does provide the opportunity for sophisticated object interaction and control using the user's own hands. When used with our library objects and their form-fitting colliders, this provides a lot of opportunity for complex behaviors and interactions, as you see here. So placing the ball inside of the vase, rolling it around inside the vase, and then tipping it out is something that you know, requires the level of, of physical interaction that we have in TDW. We currently support the Oculus Rift S headset with the Oculus Touch controllers, but we're working on supporting the Oculus Quest 2 with its built-in hand tracking capability. I think this will give us uh, some significant um, benefits uh, over the, the basic controller. So one last thing to show you, um, for some human robot collaboration scenarios, the robot agent learns about human activities by observing a human being performing those actions. Replicating this scenario in a virtual environment has many benefits, including scalability over thousands of iterations. Our IK-driven VR humanoid agent essentially mirrors the actions being performed by the human user in VR, providing a full body embodiment that a robot agent can observe performing actions in the same way it would a real human. So on the right is what I am seeing in the VR headset, and on the left is the third person camera view of the VR humanoid basically mirroring my movements. We can also teleport around the virtual environment using a standard VR teleporting paradigm to interact within spaces larger than our physical VR space or cable tethering would allow. So here we see the VR humanoid interacting with an articulatable object. In other words, an object with a door that can open and close, a microwave in this case, to place a mug inside the microwave. So this is kind of part of some scenarios that we're working on right now for the human robot collaboration. Basically a robot agent would be watching the human agent perform these act activities and would need to be reasoning about how and where it could assist the human in those activities. We plan to do a lot of expansion around this area and in particular uh, the number and range of articulatable objects that, uh, that we currently have in our library. Well, that's the end of my presentation. Um, I just wanna thank you very much. Uh, and I posted up here the um, link to the 3D World website, TW website, and also the GitHub repo. Uh, and happy to you know, chat to anyone offline. Um, there's my email, jeremyes at mit.edu. Jeremy, thank you very much. And I know we're going to transition quickly over to uh, get a, a live demo and some of the motion capture that you've been doing with, in, with the, the Emerge Lab and Talos and Praneet. So I think the floor is yours now. So thank you, Jeremy. Um, I'm just gonna go through just a couple slides before we jump right into the demo. Um, so you guys got a pretty good overview of the uh, platform. So in terms of the collaboration with the Immersion Lab, just gonna, I'd like to start off with a, a few of the software solutions that uh, we utilize here into the lab to make a lot of this happen. So um, what you saw was built in Unity. We have a lot of interest in Unreal Engine as well. So what I'm going to show in a couple slides and what we did for Jeremy is in Unity, but uh, for the sake of uh, satisfying the, everybody in the uh, uh, watching in the seminar, we're also going to show the demo in Unreal Engine. Um, we also utilize some of the Blender work to build out some models and some uh, additional assets. Um, OptiTrack 
is the system that we used to actually capture the motion capture data. And then we also utilized Motion Builder to adjust and tweak some of the uh, motion capture uh, sequences that we, we uh, would want to edit for the sake of uh, smoothing and blending in case there were any um, uh, hiccups along the way. So this is just a few images of the actual uh, production that we that we took place in the lab. And so we had a student here dressed in the OptiTrack suit that you'll see in just a moment with about 39 to 40 markers laid out on them. Um, we can build out different levels of skeletal meshes. We can include finger tracking. Um, we can add more depth into the range of motion for certain arms. We can just do the, the top half of the body. So there's different variations. What you're going to see is just a baseline avatar rig. So no finger tracking, um, but you'll see the upper body and the lower body. Um, so in the picture to the left, we are using real world objects for a little bit more of that realism in terms of picking up trays and putting things down. Um, we also have a table where you can slide things off and a podium uh, or, a, or a stand where you're actually reaching for certain pieces. So what you saw in that where he was, the avatar was reaching for those balls, this was kind of mimicking that, uh, that relationship. Um, so this is just a quick uh, idea of how we did the motion tracking um, uh, editing in Motion Builder. And so this rig, uh, this avatar is being manipulated by the, uh, by the skeletal mesh, but it doesn't seem to be playing here, unfortunately. Um, I have a couple others that might be able to play. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, naturally what you'll see is this avatar moving uh, given the data that we, we presented. So um, you'll see this in, in action, so not a problem. Um, but just know that a lot of this data sometimes needs to be put into Motion Builder to do some adjustments. Um, he mentioned IK and, and kind of the relationships between the shoulders and the arms. So um, we'll start with the demo for the sake of time, and then we'll uh, leave some time for questions and discussions in the end. Okay, for this demo, I have suited up uh, in a motion tracking suit. So now, uh, if you can see the screen, you see uh, all these points moving. And the uh, motion that to track all these points. Uh, Talis is going to infer the position of uh, the different bones in my body based on where all of these track points are. And uh, as you can see, if I move around, we can track specific movements. And uh, you can stop the share screen. And now if you focus on the screen, now if you focus on the screen that's next to me, for the rest of the demo, I'll stop talking. And you'll just see me hopefully move. And so the typical approach would to be, uh, you know, physically or manually uh, creating these animations with the avatar. So you're adjusting each arm and you're changing the hips key for, key frame by key frame. In this way, we can suit somebody up, allow them to naturally move and utilize those movements and that fluidity into the animation and the simulation. So with this combined with the physics aspects of things, we can really create a realistic opportunity uh, or a realistic avatar to uh, even, you know, bring that even further. And so you can do some objects as well. He's going to try to sit down. Um, so you can interact with physical objects in this. And the cool thing about this as well is it just doesn't need to be one person. We could do multiple people at, the at a time. And so we could have two to three avatars uh, you know, interacting with each other, throwing virtual or physical objects, and reading that physical-based um, animations there. Um, we can also overlay. So right now, what you see is just a mannequin. Um, but we, you know, you can think about importing your own 
avatars onto that. Uh, for example, we have a photogametry system where you can scan yourself and create your own photorealistic avatar. You can, in theory, put that into Unity or Unreal Engine and move that body based on the skeletal uh, reconstruction as well. So uh, that was the demo. Hopefully um, you guys were able to see that and we'll leave kind of the remaining time for uh, questions and, and uh, discussion. So thank you again. Yeah, tell us if I could um, just jump in and make a comment here. <clears throat> the, um, the ability to stream like that is particularly interesting because um, the VR humanoid that I was showing is okay, but it's, you know, we're not really happy with the quality of the motion that is uh, coming from that very simple IK solution that's driving that guy in, in VR. And so ideally what we what we would want to do is be able to, you know, suit somebody up and have them in VR and essentially perform the motions with the smoothness that we, you know, with the fluidity that we were looking at there and then have the agent be able to observe that, uh, that activity. And obviously the more realistic and human-like the motion is, the more effective the training of the robot agent will be. And the more that, you know, it says that simulation can be used as a replacement for a human being actually performing those actions. And that's where the scalability comes in because then you can look at, you know, some perhaps procedurally modifying those actions to create some degree of variability and, and represent kind of the diff possible difference between, you know, three or four different people performing those actions or, you know, um, other kinds of, um, you know, annotations that could be made to those actions to, uh, to provide variability. So it's, it's, it's a, that's a very exciting thing, I think, for, uh, for our application. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And yeah, we do have uh, additional, um, you know, for, for our future work, we are thinking about integrating your, the finger tracking, like you, like you mentioned, Jeremy, um, as well as some, some of that facial rigging to uh, put this whole picture together, where when you grasp certain physical objects, your fingers are doing what they should be, going around the cup, um, going inside the pot, um, and the same thing with the facial rigging as well. And there's different ways of doing that. You could manually rig it, but you can also, there are software solutions that allow you to um, import your own uh, WAV file. And so your, your face will, will change depending on the audio through the language processing algorithms that have been created on that end. Um, and there's also camera rigging as well. So you can attach a camera um, you know, right to your face and essentially looking at the markers there. Um, and then your, that face and the, the avatar's face will mimic what you're, what you're doing and the emotions present. So um, right. really cool That's stuff great. to integrate all of this and, and uh, you know, get a full solid photorealistic uh, humanoid. Right, right. I had, I had another slide at the end of the VR thing that was talking about ne next steps for VR. And we just talked about one of them, but the other one that you and I have discussed, I think is, is the, um, we're very interested in exploring the benefits and capabilities that come from some of the other more advanced headsets that we know you guys are, are, are looking at and, and um, uh, will potentially, you know, have available. So the ones that, for example, like the HP one that provides the biometric um, information, you know, there's definitely some potential opportunities that um, I'm sure, you know, our researchers would be um, interested in exploring if, it, if there was the ability to, you know, connect uh, pupillometry and uh, eye tracking and so forth with the, uh, with the normal VR experience. So, you know, the data like that that's coming back from, from the builds that can be synchronized with, you know, recording VR, um, you know, the VR experiences uh, in the simulation could be very interesting. We've already had some professors who have expressed interest in that kind of thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and tracking that eye, I mean, it, it's amazing uh, how much more life an avatar gets by just gazing at certain objects. Um, you know, we're just naturally uh, in tune with, with what people are looking at. So right. if you mimic that into an avatar, uh, you know, that could really uh, make that connection. So um, yeah, I, I really look forward to incorporating some of these new technologies into, into that, yeah. Me too. <laughs> yeah.
So, so I think with that, we're probably at a, at a good place. I, I want to um, thank, thank you, Jeremy and, and Talis yeah, no and problem. Renith for both the, uh, the wonderful work of the collaboration uh, and, and participants, thank you for joining us and asking questions. Um, I'll send you the virtual and the physical round of applause. Uh, you know, it's always mm -hmm. a, a, a show that we put on here in terms of having a little bit of discussion, a little bit of demo. Uh, so that's sort of the nature of what we try to do in the Immersed series. Um, so join us next month um, we'll, with our next Immersed talk, um, topic to be released. Um, but uh, stay tuned and everybody have a, a good remainder of your day. And again, Jeremy, uh, again, thank you very much for your time. And yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's great.